you so much for joining us at the Globe Church. We hope you find this sermon really helpful to you in glorifying God and finding out more about our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're not local to London and you're listening in, uh, please do, we encourage you to go and find a local church where you can worship God together with a church family local to you. If you are in London, please do come and find us. You can find all the information about where we meet, when we meet on our website. So come and join us. We'd love to say hello. Uh, we'd love to worship together with you. But for now, we hope you enjoy the sermon and you find this really helps you in your walk with the Lord Jesus. Wonderful. Well, I wonder if you uh, have got a Bible. Could you turn to John uh, chapter 16? John chapter 16. And um, if you were here last Sunday, you'll know that this is kind of the third point of last Sunday's sermon. So last Sunday, um, we were looking at Jesus teaching about the Holy Spirit. And I had three points, but only managed to do two of them. Um, and I said we'd come back and do the third one today. So that's what we're going to do. Now, if you weren't here, don't worry. Um, it's going to make sense on its own. But that's, that's what we're doing. Um, and we're in the, the end of John 15 into John chapter 16. And Jesus is teaching about the, the Holy Spirit. He calls him the advocate. And he tells us that when he comes, when the Spirit comes, he's going to do three things. Verse 26 says... When the advocate comes, whom I'll send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. So when the Spirit comes, he will testify about Jesus. So the Holy Spirit is testifying. That's one of his great works. Testifying about Jesus. Saying to people, look at Jesus. Like like a spotlight shining on Jesus and saying, look how great he is. That's what the Spirit does. The second thing that we're told he does um, is in verse 8 of chapter 16, when he comes, there's that phrase again, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. That is his convicting work. The spirit will come and will show this world where we've got things wrong. He will convict us. We thought about that last week. And I do just, in a minute, I'm going to pick up on that um, a little bit more. But then the third thing is in verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So there are the three big things that Jesus says the spirit is going to do. He will testify, he will convict, and he will guide. And we're going to spend most of our time this afternoon thinking about that idea of him guiding us into all truth. Why why does that matter? But let's read um, right the way through that passage so we can see it all. It's important that we listen to what Jesus is saying. So I'm going to read from John 15, 26. And Jesus says this, When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you've been with me from the beginning. All this I've told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They'll do such things because they've not known the Father or me. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you'll remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you that this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I've said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it's from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Um, I want want you to have in your mind uh, an image. Um, I want you to imagine runway landing lights. Uh, I guess not many of us have ever landed a plane. Anyone ever landed a plane? No, it's pretty niche, isn't it? Um, 
Imagine landing runway. I guess we've all sort of seen them. Imagine you were flying a plane and you got a bit lost and there was a storm and it was dark. And then suddenly you, you see the lights of home. You see the landing lights and those lights are guiding you home. Suddenly you go from being lost to being guided home. What we're going to think about this, this evening is the Spirit as the one who guides us into all the truth, who guides us home. You see, what you discover in the Bible is that God is a God who guides his people. And the idea of God guiding his people is often very closely connected with the idea of light as well. So in the Old Testament, um, back in the days of um, Exodus um, and Numbers, God's people were wandering around in the desert. They, got, uh, they spent 40 years wandering in the desert. It would be a pretty frightening place to be, particularly at night, right? And yet what God did is that God came to them and he led his people. He didn't abandon them. He didn't say, well, you're on your own. Good luck. Hope you find your way. Instead, God came and he came and appeared above his people in a pillar of fire to light the way for them so that they could see where they were going. He guided them. And he guided them on that journey all the way home to the promised land where they were going. That's what God is like. He guides his people. I think that's a very precious truth. That he doesn't abandon his people and say, off you go. He guides. You, you see a similar um, image in Psalm 119. Um, and Psalm 119, verse 105. Don't worry too much about turning to it. Um, it says, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. And so God, when he speaks his word, it lights the way so that we know where to go. I went to this little village once to speak at a carol service. Travelled out from central London. It was ridiculous. It was so dark. I got out of my car. I, I couldn't see anything. I, I, I was like, I can't see where I'm stepping. It, it was so dark. It was crazy. And then I noticed all these people walking along. They all had torches. You live it. Anyway. But I was desperate for a torch that would just guide me. That's what God does for his people. You see, by nature, we are in darkness. By nature, we are far away from God. By nature, we are lost. And we need to be guided home. Now, in the John's gospel, this image of light and dark is really big. Jesus came into the darkness and said, I'm the light of the world. What's he claiming? That's not just a random, oh, I'm a light. What he's claiming is, remember that pillar of light, that pillar of fire above the people, God appearing to his people. Jesus says, that's me. I've come into this dark world to guide people out of darkness into light, to guide people who are lost so that they might be found, to guide people who are away so that they might come home. Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. But here's the problem. If you've been around in Globe Church for the last few weeks and you haven't picked this up yet, then you seriously need to wake up. Jesus is about to leave his disciples. In John's gospel, he's about to go to a cross, die, rise again, return to heaven, and they're going to be left in this world on their own, which begs the question, how are we going to know the way if the light of the world is gone? How are we going to see the way? How are we going to be guided? Answer, the Spirit will come, and he will guide you into all truth. And that is why the Spirit is so precious and important, because it's the Spirit who guides us, and we're going to think about that guiding work. Of the Spirit. Now I want to back up a little bit into something we covered last week around the convicting work of Jesus, uh, of the Spirit. Because I want us to understand that the first thing the Spirit does as he guides us is that he does show us where we get things wrong. So back in verse 8, it says, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And last week, we talked about the fact that the Spirit comes and he shows us that we're wrong. He shows us where we sin. He shows us that we fall short of Jesus' standard. He shows us that there's judgment. The Spirit comes and he shows us we're wrong. Now, someone said to me after the service last week, the trouble is I just feel so 
burden and guilty and ashamed. You know, I, I just feel so, you know, I, I, I ask the Spirit to show me where I'm wrong. And it's like, oh, there's so much stuff where I'm wrong. And that conversation got me thinking because, you see, in the Bible, there's another voice. The voice of the enemy. What, you know, the Bible calls God's enemy the devil. And one of the things that the devil does is he accuses people. He's an accuser. Now look, stick with us, right? Stick with us. There's the accuser who comes to us and says, you're wrong. And there's the spirit of God who comes and convicts us and says, you're wrong. How do you know which is which? <laughs> How do you know which one is speaking to you? How do you know whether it's the voice of the accuser or the voice of the Spirit of God convicting you and guiding you into truth. I want us to think about that for a second. And if, you, if you've got a Bible, turn to Zechariah. Um, Zechariah chapter 3. This might seem like a bit of a random place to go at first. But just have a look at what we discover in Zechariah chapter 3. Zechariah is having this vision, and it says, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, Take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I've taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. So here's the scene. Right, can you get the scene? Can you picture it? Here is Joshua. And there is the Lord God and Satan ready to accuse. Now, what's the accuser saying? It's not difficult to imagine, is it? Joshua, you are filthy. You are disgusting. Look at the state of you. What a mess. You're so unworthy. Do you think that you can come into God's prayer? Who on earth do you think you are? You're filthy. That's the accuser. And do you see what God says to the accuser? God says to the accuser, the Lord rebuke you. Shut up. Shut up your accusations. You destroyer. You one who wants to do harm, who has no love, no compassion. Be quiet. But what does God then say to Joshua? Does he go, don't you worry about that nasty Satan. You're not dirty. You're fine. You look lovely. Is that what God says to him? No, he says to him, you're filthy. You are. You're dirty. Your clothes are a state. Let's sort that out. He says, let's take those clothes, those filthy clothes, take them off. Bring him new clothes. Bring him new clothes. Let's dress him in beauty and purity. And that's the difference. You see, the accuser's voice will only lead you to a place of shame, despair, and hopelessness. But the spirit's voice will lead you to a place of sorrow and forgiveness and joy. It's really important that we learn to discern the difference between the voice of the accuser and the voice of the spirit who convicts us. You see, I think many, many Christians live their lives under a condemnation, an accusation of that you're useless, you are worthless, you're filthy. Why would God be bothered with you? You've got no right to be in church. You've got no right to take communion. You've got no right to serve. Who do you think you are? That's the voice of the accuser. That's not the voice of the spirit. Because the spirit comes and the spirit says, you are guilty. You are sinful. You are wrong. And he will show us where we're wrong. But then he will take us to Jesus. And he will say, let me give you clean clothes to wear. And he will transform you and he will make you beautiful and he will bring you freedom and joy. And it may be this afternoon that for some of us, we've listened to the voice of the accuser for too long. And this afternoon, Jesus wants to say to you, 
That's not my spirit speaking to you. My spirit will show you you're guilty, but he will bring you to a place of joy and forgiveness. Perhaps this afternoon, for some of us, there is a burden of shame that needs to be lifted, an accusation that needs to be taken away, a condemnation that you need to know Jesus has paid for in full. You see, Jesus went to a cross to die, and on the cross, as Jesus died, all the condemnation for our sin was placed on him. All of our filth was placed on him so that we might wear his beautiful robes. You see, the spirit of truth, he will guide you to Jesus for forgiveness. The landing lights of the spirit will lead you to land in Jesus, even when you feel guilty. As the spirit convicts you and makes you feel guilty, he'll say, come on, let's go. Here we go. We're landing. He takes you to the cross so that you might be forgiven. So the spirit, let the spirit drive you to Jesus. Let him take you to Jesus even as he convicts you. But let's now get into verse 12, and there's two other things I I just want us to see. And the first is that the Spirit will make up for our limited capacity, our limited knowledge, our limited understanding. So look at verse 12. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. Someone did message me after the service last week and say it's quite ironic that I (laughs) finished last week's sermon there. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. (laughs) But Jesus, he's looking at his disciples and it's really tender, isn't it? It's really kind of compassionate. You know, he's been going for like, what, nearly three pages. Talking to his disciples, they're exhausted, they're tired. And he looks at them and he, he can see that they're just... They're full. I don't know if if you're a primary school teacher, perhaps you have this experience. You know, you're teaching some kids and you go, these kids, they're they're full. These kids, they've got no more space. They've got six hours left of today and they've they've got no space left. Because you sometimes get to that point or perhaps you go to a conference or you're sitting in a lecture and you're like, that's it, I'm done. I've reached capacity. I'm maxed out. Nothing left. No space. The SD card is full. That's where these guys are at. Jesus is so, uh, oh, this is it. You're, you're at capacity. I have much more to say, but you can't bear it. And so this is important for us to understand. We as human beings, we have a limited capacity. We have a limited ability. Jesus says, I have weighty things. That idea of more than you can have bear. They're big things, Jesus says. I've got so much I need to teach you. So many things that are weighty. So many things that are heavy. So many things that are so important. But you You can't bear them at the moment because we are limited. We like to think we're not. We like to think we can know everything. We like to think that we can do everything. We like to think that we have no limits, but we are. We're very limited. And Jesus knows that. And when Jesus says he has much more to say to you, oh man, does he have more to say. It's not like Jesus goes, look, I've nearly finished. I've only got a few more pages. I've only got a few more thoughts. No, Jesus has got infinite, eternal knowledge. So here is Jesus, who we already discovered in John's gospel. He is the word who was in the beginning with God and was God, who through him all things were made. This is the creator of the universe who says, I've got a few more things I I want to say to you. This is the one who is the eternal son of God, who has all power and majesty and strength. I've got a few more things I'd like to say to you, but you can't bear it. You see, here is the big difference between God and humanity. God is unlimited and we are limited. God is infinite and we are finite. We do not have an unlimited capacity in Psalm 147, there's this great quote about God, this great description of God, where the psalmist writes, Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. So you have the God whose understanding has no limit meeting up with human capacity, which is very limited. And I get to the 
maxed out limit pretty quickly, I discover, in my life. So how is God going to speak any more? Bearing in mind that these 11 disciples are going to be responsible for writing down the Bible. Jesus didn't write any words down. He founded a world religion, but he wrote nothing. He entrusted it all to these 11 with their limited capacity. They can't even bear anymore. How on earth are they ever going to be able to remember everything? Well, Jesus says, verse 13, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth. You see, the spirit makes up for our limited capacity. We don't know. We don't understand. We can't remember. We can't think. We get things wrong. And so the spirit comes to guide us into all truth. The spirit who is great and whose understanding has no limit is the one who comes and guides into all truth. So when they sat down to write the Bible, they weren't going, oh man, what? Oh, what did he say? Can anyone remember? What was that story? He told a story. What was the story? Oh, I've forgotten it. No, because the spirit who has understanding without limit comes and guides them. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as they wrote their gospels, were guided into all truth so that we might have the full word of God, the all that we need. And not just them, but Paul and Peter and all the others who wrote bits of the Bible, guided into all truth. This is not the opinions of some human beings. We're surrounded by opinions, right? People have got opinions, but every opinion that we read is a limited human opinion. Every tweet, every blog, every wise human being who's got something to say, it's coming from a limited capacity human being. And yet here is the spirit without limit who comes and speaks so that we might know everything we need to know. And the interesting thing is that this is exactly how Jesus spoke. This this, this might come as a surprise to you, but back in John chapter 3, Jesus said, um, the one whom God has sent, that's Jesus, speaks the words of God, for God gives the spirit without limit. So look, stick with this. Here's here's what Jesus is saying. Jesus says, I've come from the Father and I speak the word of God and I speak because the spirit of God, Jesus has the spirit without limit. So the eternal infinite spirit dwells in Jesus and therefore every word that Jesus speaks is the wisdom and eternal truth of God. So Jesus speaks because he's filled with the spirit and then he says to his disciples, now I'm going to send the same spirit to you. And if you're filled with the Spirit, then he will guide you into all truth. This is why we can believe that the Bible is true. If this book is the best ideas and recollections of some human beings, we've got no hope. But if this book is the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God, if this book is the book by which the Spirit guided them into all truth so that we might have it before us, And we can build our lives on this. We can trust this. We can believe this. We can depend on it. That's the claim. And it isn't, that was was what it meant to them. But it is still the case today that the Spirit guides us into all truth. He's still at work. He didn't just give us a book and go, right, there you go. He now uses this book. He takes these words and he uses them to guide us into all truth. So here, if you like, this is the landing light. This is why Psalm 119 says, your word is a lamp to my feet. So when I get to the dark village, I get my Bible out and I go like, you know, I walk like this because it shows the path. And if I close my Bible, then I wander off the path into danger and I get into a mess. And it's the word of God that will guide us into all truth. It's the spirit of God and the word of God together in tandem that form the two lines of lights that make us land straight and safe. This is why we treasure the spirit and we treasure the word and we don't divide them. 
So when you find yourself thinking, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to think about this, I don't know what to believe about this, don't opt for the limited opinions of limited human beings. Instead, choose the unlimited truth of the spirit given without limit. There's one final thing to see. Stick with it, we're doing well. There's one final thing to see. And that is that the spirit will lead us the landing lights will lead us into the very heart of the Trinity God. It's very interesting where Jesus goes next. Bearing in mind, he's just said to his disciples, I've got many things to say, more than you can now bear. And then he starts to talk about the Trinity. <laughs> it's great. You see, it's so interesting what, what we're told. We get a little glimpse into the very Trinity itself. We're told about the Spirit. He will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what's to come. He will glorify me because it's from me that he'll receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he'll make known to you. I mean, what is that about? I mean, whose truth is this? He's going to receive this from here and this belongs to you and this belongs to me and this is going to be received from what's going on? I think what you're getting a glimpse into is the beauty of this God, the Father, Son, and Spirit. Do you remember in chapter 3, Jesus says, I only speak what the Spirit says. The Spirit comes, I only speak what the Spirit says. And now he flips it around and says, the Spirit only says what I give him. (laughs) Because what we're being shown is that this God that we're talking about is not some distant disinterested deity who dwells in splendid isolation. He's not some monolithic mono-God. Instead, he is the beautiful Trinity God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who together share this truth. And all that is the Father's belongs to the Son. What a remarkable thing for Jesus to say. Everything that is God's is mine. Everything that is my father's is mine. This is a beautiful relationship of perfect openness and sharing and trust. And Jesus says, I receive it from the father and I give it to the son and the son makes it known to you. The spirit makes it known to you. Because what we're being shown is that God is so beautiful and even his revelation is beautiful. And the place where he wants to lead you is to lead you to that Trinity God, because it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit where you will find home. You see, there is the most beautiful being in the universe. You know, all of my relationships are spoiled. All of my relationships are tainted by sin. Even my very best relationships are spoiled by selfishness or by greed or by selfish ambition. But not this trinity this perfect beautiful trinity where there is just beautiful oneness and this this is where the spirit of truth will guide us to to this trinity god he's beautiful i think too too often we kind of shrink god down and we imagine god as some thing out there some force Whereas actually he is perfect relationship. Father, Son, and Spirit dwelling in perfect union. And we mess up God, right? We mess up this Trinity if we try and squish them all into one and go, oh, it's just Father, Son, and Spirit. They're all just different names for the same God. No, they're not. (laughs) Or when we split them up and go, yeah, well, Jesus isn't really God, just the Father's God. The, The old... The the ancient creeds of history, when they argued about this stuff, talked about neither confounding the persons nor dividing the essence. That is not mushing them all together as one, nor splitting them up into three, but saying, no, they are three and yet one. That's who the Trinity is. Which means you'll never find an illustration for it, right? This is what we'd love to do this. We go, oh, I've got an illustration. I've got an illustration for the Trinity. Great. What is it? Well, it's like water, isn't it? Water. Because water is ice, water, steam. There you go, three in one. You go, yeah, yeah, but the problem is what you've done there, you see, what you've done there is you've confounded the persons. Now, you see, 
By which I mean that you cannot have water and steam they don't, and ice. They don't coexist at the same time. It's modalism. You have three different modes of God. It's just that sometimes he's the spirit, sometimes he's the father. So that's a rubbish illustration. Oh, it's like an egg. Egg! Like an egg. Let's try an egg. Because in an egg, you've got a shell and a yolk and a, something else. White. You go, no, no, you see, what you've done there is you've divided the essence, you see. That's the problem. Because the shell isn't made of the same stuff as the yolk, right? They're completely different. So you've got three bits. And the shell can exist without the, you know, you can blow the middle bit out, spit it away, put it in the bin, and paint the shell. And you've still got the, the shell. So you've split it all up. You can divide it into its little bits. You can't do that with God. Anyway. Turns out there's no illustration, no perfect illustration, because God is God and he's incomprehensible and he's magnificent, he's incomparable, and you can't call him an egg. So stop calling him an egg, all right? He's God, Father, Son, and Spirit. And rather than try and understand him, we should bow down and worship him. And we should let the Spirit lead us home. You see, this is what the Spirit does. And Jesus gives us a little glimpse here of this beautiful Father, Son, and Spirit relationship. Because that's who the Spirit is. He's God. And he leads us to God. All of that to say, let's land this, all of that to say, here is this beautiful Spirit. This Spirit who is like landing lights who will show you that you're wrong, but will lead you to Jesus to find forgiveness. Who will guide you into all truth, not some limited human opinion, but into all infinite, limitless truth as you listen to him. And who will lead you to the very heart of the Trinity God. Who will bring you home to the God who made you and loves you and knows you and welcomes you. So I want to suggest that you get to know this spirit. You take an interest in him. You ask that Jesus would give you this spirit more and more, that you might know his work in your life and those lights lighting the way. Let's have a moment to pray, and then we're going to share bread and wine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious work of your spirit. We thank you that this spirit of God, this spirit who comes from the very heart of God, this spirit who is himself God, is the one who guides us into all truth. He guides us to Jesus himself. Holy Spirit, even this afternoon, would you be those lights lighting our way back to Jesus, lighting our way back to that place of truth, lighting our way home. Holy Spirit, we thank you for the precious gift you are. Guide our feet. Shine your light on our path, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.